So next we're going to be moving on to Bruce McIntosh. He's going to share his experience about um, AS ASC. Uh, he's been a great leader and uh, mentor, and he pioneered a lot of work that we're actually doing right now. Good afternoon. My name is Bruce McIntosh. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy days uh, to spend some time uh, at the RSC to learn a little bit more about uh, potentially doing robotic inguinal hernia and, and gallbladder surgery in your ASC. Here are my disclosures. A little bit about the concept of an ambulatory surgery center versus a hospital. For the most part, uh, what we get paid as professionals is the same. There are some nuanced differences that may be upcoming, but the facility fees, the amount of money that's actually paid to the, uh, the hospital or the ASC is substantially different uh, than those uh, that we receive at the hospital. Uh, if it's a hospital outpatient department, the typical facility fees in Michigan are about 80% of that that are received by the hospital. And if it's a freestanding ASC, such as the one that I work in, it's about 60% of the hospital. However, in return, you get to work at a facility that's typically more efficient than hospitals, and this has a lot to do with the infrastructure and size. Um, many of the uh, ASCs will have 23-hour uh, capabilities. Uh, we have it, but don't choose to use it because there's just not enough cases in our facility that would warrant uh, staffing it as such. The fee structures will vary by state, so certainly if this is something you're interested in pursuing, uh, you'll need to do a little bit of due diligence to learn a little bit more about uh, what happens in your particular region of the country. I work at Unisor Surgery Center. It's a freestanding surgery center that is primarily physician owned. Uh, there is a portion that uh, uh, was owned by a uh, hospital. They are now no longer part of the, the ownership team. And there's a portion that's owned by the management company. And again, that will probably be uh, phased out as well. How you set up uh, the ownership uh, is an individual thing. I don't think that one is any better than the other. It's not just uh, physician owners that to do cases there. There are many non-owner physicians that uh, operate at the surgery center. It's AAAHC accredited. We have five operating rooms. And I have had an SIE robot there for the past three and a half years. We're located in Michigan, uh, which creates a unique set of challenges because of the overall uh, reimbursements that we have at Michigan, which are fairly poor relative to other parts of the country. Here's a view. We occupy the first floor of, of a building that uh, is a Class A medical facility, uh, about 2,500 square feet. You can see from the photos that it's appointed quite uh, nicely, which makes our patients and their families while they're waiting uh, much more comfortable. We think this is an important part of the overall process. Each patient has an individual and private room that serves as their pre-op room and the recovery room. We do a full a myriad of cases, including a substantial number of outpatient total joints at our center. So why do you want to do cases in an ambulatory surgery center as opposed to the hospital? First, there's a decreased cost to the system as a whole. The facility reimbursements, as we mentioned, are substantially less than they are at the hospital. And therefore, if you do cases at a center like that, your scorecard that the insurance companies uh, all per, uh, create uh, regarding you will look better. You're a more cost-effective surgeon. And if it costs less to do the case, uh, if the patient has to incur a percentage copay, that out-of-pocket expense will be less for the patient. Additionally, as we move into the ACO model, there's the opportunity for shared savings rebates from the insurance companies. These are individually negotiated, but can be substantial. We're moving to a new era of medicine, which is not volume-based, but value-based. And we would define value as outcome over cost. And if you want to add in there a strategy component as well, I think that's pretty reasonable. Because cases are more efficient and your turnover times are traditionally less, you may be able to do more cases in the same amount of time and that extra professional fee really is a substantial uh, component of any increased profitability uh, from using the ASC as opposed to what you may or may not get as a uh, distribution check if you're an investor. Because it's a nicer facility, it costs less and it's more efficient, typically patient satisfaction scores are very high. 
And again, that drives reimbursement down the road with uh, some of the HCAP scores and, and whatnot. So there may be a downstream effect. I don't think it's really substantial at this point, but has the potential to be as we move more to this value model. What's the role of uh, robotics in the ASC? As we mentioned, uh, we're moving from a volume-based to a value-based model, and we can potentially demonstrate an increased value by doing the cases uh, in the ASC. But it's, appropriate, it's important that you choose the appropriate case to do at your ASC location, not only by case type, but by patient. Not every patient will qualify for an uh, ASC, and so I think you have to really look at each case individually. In uh, my uh, surgery center, we do uh, inguinal hernias and single-site cholecystectomy. As I mentioned, we presently have an SIE. I think I would do a larger volume of cholecystectomies uh, if I had a forearm robot, and that's in the near future for us, hopefully. Also, you can do some small incisional hernias. Some of those patients end up needing to spend the night, so I would recommend doing that, if, particularly if you have a capacity for functional 23-hour uh, stays. So here's a report card. We talked about the report cards and scorecards. Uh, here's my uh, Optum uh, performance uh, report card uh, compared to U UP, which is United Physicians, my physician organization. And if you look, you'll see that you know, my hernias cost on average $1,500 less than the average across the board, and cholecystectomies up to $4,500 less. Now this is amalgamation of cases that are done at the hospital and in my surgery center, but since I do about 50% of my volume in the surgery center, this is probably the thing that's driving those costs down. So that, that provides substantial value. All of the primary care physicians will have access to these report cards if they don't already. Certainly that data is out there. And then with the shared savings model, they'll decide where they want to send patients based on who provides the best value. So if you look at the out-of-pocket expenses, we saw that the cholecystectomy was almost $4,500 worth of uh, savings relative to the average. Assuming a 20% copay, which is pretty typical in Michigan these days, it could be up to $900 less out-of-pocket for that same operation to be performed. What's happening now is that patients are getting savvy to this, and I'm beginning to see some of my partner's patients. My partner doesn't use a surgery center. Patients are seeing them and saying, geez, I want this done over at Unisource because I hear it's a nice place and I may save some money out of my pocket. And therefore, they're being uh, sent over to me uh, for evaluation about uh, whether it's appropriate to do them at the surgery center. And I'm, I'm doing many of those patients at the surgery center. It's important to note that the patients are driving some of this change and they're going to continue to drive it as they seek value. With an ACO shared savings, the PCPs are going to choose a referral specialist based on the availability to go to alternate sites of care, which typically means a lower cost of care. So your referrer network may change if you're not involved in an ASC or a lower priced option, lower cost option. Uh, you may not start to see as many patients anymore as these report cards become more readily available to the primary care to allow them in deciding who they should send their patients to. This is kind of a cool thing that's happening in Michigan. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is now changing their professional fees. This is a new change that hasn't really been done to date. So typically in the past, whether you did the case at the ASC or at the hospital, you got paid the same amount of money based on the CPT code. Blue Cross is looking at an initiative to bump up the professional fees. They're talking about a 10 to 15% bump for surgeries that are done at an ambulatory surgery facility as opposed to the hospital. Uh, it isn't completely baked yet. Uh, they're working out the final details. Uh, I would anticipate in Q1 or Q2 of 2020, we're gonna start to see this. So for doing the same operations you'd do, doing them quicker, doing them more efficiently, you may take home a little bit more money at the end of the day on the professional side as well. And here, Blue Cross is sending this out in the record, which they sent out to all providers, suggesting that this is an option as well. So they're not only incentivizing the physicians to choose it, but they're sending this out to the primary care physicians so they can look at alternate sites of care for those low risk patients. So one of the objectives of moving cases to an HOPD, if you're in a hospital, 
you know, a lot of times the hospitals are like, oh my God, we're stealing cases, we're going to lose cases. Well, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. In today's world, we do high acuity cases, either laparoscopic, open, or uh, robotically uh, at the hospital, as well as doing some lower acuity cases, which we tend to do through an MIS approach. In the future, the goal is to shift those low acuity cases to an alternate site of care, which allows more access to the high acuity cases to the robot. As a result of that, we believe that that will decrease the number of open surgeries by increasing the number of minimally invasive surgeries and increase and improve the throughput for those more complex cases. And that potentially leads to uh, more cases and potentially more reimbursement down the road. I think that this is the model going forward and something that we should probably uh, look to embrace. Now, if you're a hospital administration, you may say, oh my gosh, you know, we're going to take those cases away and, you know, our robotic volumes are going to go down. The robotic program is going to fall into an upheaval. Well, we got our robot in uh, Q4 of 2016 at the surgery center and we really didn't get going in Q until Q1 of uh, uh, the following year. And you can see that when we did get going, really our volumes never took a, uh, a big hit, even though I was doing a fair number of cases over at the ASC. And in fact, since that time, our robotic volumes have grown to the point where we've had to add an incremental robot at my hospital. So we now have four robots at the hospital, plus I have access to the one in the ASC. We haven't looked back. So you can reassure your hospital administrators that this isn't going to take a substantial hit because we're really moving the low acuity cases. And what it's doing is it's allowing the colectomies and the thoracic cases and the, the big complex Apple reconstructions to be done through a minimally invasive approach more effectively at your hospital. Those actually are honestly better contribution margin cases. And so in the long run, it's a win-win. So this is a, a paper that uh, one of my medical students uh, presented uh, as part of his Embark project that he had to do. It was a, a study looking at the value of uh, robotic inguinal uh, surgeries comparing this hospital to the surgery center. Now my hospital's uh, IRB didn't want us to use absolute numbers, so we had to create a relative value scale so that we could uh, compare the two. And the results were this. Uh, we found a shorter length of stay in the surgery center. This was measured in hours, not in days, obviously, because they're all outpatient cases. There was a lower cost to the patient and system when they were done in the surgery center. And not surprisingly, patients with more comorbid conditions tended to be done at the hospital. And that makes sense. Like I said earlier, the, the ASC isn't for every patient every time. And a final conclusion, if value is simply defined as outcomes over cost, then the results would suggest that value is uh, greater in the ASC setting. I think that uh, that doesn't come as a surprise to anyone, but this is one of the first studies that begins to define that more specifically and improve our hypothesis. My surgery center ex experience at Unisource, I've been a owner of Unisource Surgery Center since uh, 2004. In November of 2016, we acquired the robot. Since that time, I've done over 500 cases using an SIE. So that's single site coli and inguinal hernia. As I'm doing less and less single site coli cystectomy, it's more hernias right now. I'm able to do eight to nine cases in an eight hour workday typically, um, particularly in case on days when I'm able to bounce to a second room, I can be extremely effective on those days. Um, but even if I'm just doing robotic cases, I can get uh, six cases in pretty easily. Uh, incremental growth uh, will uh, then fill, backfill the robotic cases at the hospital, as we demonstrated earlier. From a financial standpoint, understand that Michigan is one of the most challenging states to work in from a reimbursement standpoint, both facility and professional. Uh, there is an S2900 code, which is an add-on code on the facility side, and many of the payers are realizing that even if they are paying a little bit extra to have that case done robotically at the ASC, it's still less money than they would pay if they're doing it at the hospital. And so we've been able to negotiate that S2900 code. And there are a couple of different ways of doing it. You can do it as a set fee, or you can do it as a bump in the overall allowable. Uh, depends upon which uh, payer. The key point here is that 
if we can make this work in Michigan, you can make this work anywhere. You just have to uh, uh, be willing to put in the due diligence and do the negotiations. But if you're able to do that, you can uh, have a great uh, success with a, a robotics uh, program in your ASC. The cost breakdown, we have the fixed cost to run the room. That's about $600 an hour. We then take an amortized cost of the robot, both the lease, in our case, it's a lease, and uh, then the maintenance fees. Uh, so if we do more cases in a given month, the cost per case for the robot and to have the robot available becomes less. Uh, then you have the INA costs, the overall supply costs for the non-robotic portions, and the ASC has hired a PA that works with me on these cases, so I have someone that's skilled in, in doing the cases, and we offset uh, a portion of that salary. The PA also helps with some of the total joints and some of the other cases, so it's not purely for robotics cases, but we certainly take full advantage of a highly trained and skilled uh, surgical uh, robotic PA. Our contribution margin depends on the case we're doing. Coley's uh, a little over a thousand. Uh, unilateral hernia a little under a thousand. The bilateral hernias we take a little bit of a hit on, and that's because most of the insurance companies won't pay for that uh, additional piece of mesh. They don't have a way of doing that. And so uh, we, we take it a little bit uh, uh, more of a, a hit, but it's still a positive contribution margin. Beyond that, there's a halo effect. So if I'm gonna spend a day doing robotics cases at my ASC, I'm gonna take the other non-robotic cases that I might have on at that time as well. And those would be cases if I were at the hospital, I would have done them all in the hospital. So uh, there's a halo effect and you gain a certain number of cases that are non-robotic. That's more difficult to quantify. And over the course of time, if you can increase the volume of those robotic cases, because you're driving down the incremental cost of the using the robot on a per case basis, your contribution margins will go up. Here's a look at uh, our data from Unisource taking all cases. And you can see at the bottom, our total contribution margins, $172,000 for 2019. Now remember, if I weren't, didn't have a robot at my ASC, all of those cases would be done at the hospital. So that's all found money. It's a win-win. The payoff. The payoff is that I have an increased uh, referral uh, uh, network because of the potential savings for the patients and the shared savings from the ACO. My turnover times are way better than they are at the hospital. I have a great robotic team at the hospital, but the physical plant makes it more challenging. My average robot to robot turnover time at the ASC is 22 minutes. It's been as short as 12. There was a case where we had a contamination and we were still able to turn that over in 36 minutes. We have consistently high patient satisfaction scores. I'm done earlier, so I get to go home or do other things that I enjoy. We've improved revenue both at the hospital and revenue into my pocket. And as a result, we hope to upgrade to an X later this year. So I think that as we grow, that will allow us to expand and do more cases and potentially get other specialties such as uh, gynecology for some same day uh, hysterectomies, things like that. I think we'll be able uh, to do in the next step. And that's my story. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to uh, learn a little bit about a robotic surgery in the ASC. And I will be happy to take any questions that you may have. Bruce, uh, great talk, as always, awesome. um, fascinating. I think it's an interesting uh, field that is not really yet explored on a large scale. So um, one of the questions I have is utilization. So when, let's say we have a group of surgeons and they're thinking of uh, purchasing a robot in their surgical center that they actually own. So as they prepare their agenda or their, their, their checkbook, what do they have to think about? And what's the thought process and you'd like to advise them to kind of go ahead and proceed to purchase their first robot for the surgical center. Do you have any particular tips or advice, or do you have any uh, cutoff uh, numbers? Well, I think you have to look at the overall cost in your center. We looked at a number when we have a lease, and the lease will depend upon what type of robot you put in. We put an SIE in because it was more cost effective. Uh, that has a downside in that you have a limited number of cases you can do. You can't do some forearm GYN cases, for instance, um, but its overall cost for the lease becomes less. So you can work in the cost of the lease. You have to pay attention to the cost of the, the maintenance uh, program. 
there are ways you can make that less uh, by perhaps rather than having a six hour turnaround, a 24 hour turnaround on some of the, the maintenance. And those are things that you can negotiate uh, with intuitive. But having said all that, 12 to 15 cases a month is typically the break even on the robot and the, the supply itself. But you provide a contribution margin. So even if there's not a net profit before then, you're still putting cash into the center and you're bringing cases and you're bringing halo cases. So that number isn't quite as easy to derive. Thank you. Another thing, the pandemic has changed the way I think we do medicine. So one of the guys mentioned, how about in the next, I would say a couple of months or a couple of years, things start to shift away from being in major medical centers where you don't have to have that exposure to many people. Like let's say you wanna have a hernia, you don't really need to go to major uh, medical center. What's your take on this? And do you think there's big potential in surgical centers in the next couple of years with this pandemic? Absolutely. I think that even before the pandemic, there was MRSA. Uh, you know, our infection rates are substantially less in the ASC because we don't have as many dirty and contaminated cases. So there aren't as many bacteria floating around. Uh, so patients are aware of that. And when you mention that as a point to them, uh, they're like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that supports their decision to go to the ASC. It's certainly not a standalone decision, uh, but it comes into play. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to go to Miami. Uh, Dr. Ballaster has a question. Hey, Bruce. Awesome talk there. Um, so I've been approached many times about uh, uh, going in and purchasing a robot for an ASC. And I know you've touched about this uh, a little bit with uh, Dr. Kutsi's question. Um, but what advice do you have for me uh, prior to uh, venturing into that space? So I guess it, it matters. The, the bigger question is, are you going to purchase it yourself and then do it as a release to the ASC, or are you going to have the ASC lease it directly? The, the plan was for uh, the surgeons to actually purchase a robot themselves. You know, I, I think that's a unique model. You know, we've looked at that uh, up here. I think you have to have a large enough people that commit to doing it. And then you have to figure out, in essence, you become a leasing company, though. So you're not really doing it directly, and I think you have to look at the tax implications. Uh, it's not as straightforward, and quite frankly, Intuitive has it nailed down pretty well. If you're buying a refurbished uh, uh, machine, then you have to look at the certification process and how they want to do that. Um, I think it's a possibility for you, but probably you're just adding another layer. Uh, and I think if you invest in the surgery center, and then you can reap the profits directly from oh, there. Probably. And especially if it's all a robotic surgeons based surgery center, you can just avoid that middle uh, ground. Yeah, I have a, a follow up question to that. Uh, I've, I've always been somewhat hesitant to invest in an ASC because I didn't want um, I didn't want to feel that my practice was motivated to satisfy my bottom line. How do you decipher which cases exactly are going to be best suited in the ASC versus which cases are best suited in the main hospital? My view is that I look at every case as a potential for the ASC, and it's not because it's driving money to my bottom line. Uh, honestly, it isn't. It's allowing me to do more cases, and my patients are more comfortable, and they have less money out of pocket. So there's all value to them. If I take home a little bit of money at the end of the day because I'm an investor, that's great but that isn't the driving factor. So I look for reasons not to do it in the ASC. And if there's no reason not to do it, I try and schedule them for the ASC. Awesome. Bruce, here, one more question. What's your advice and, um, and take on international robotics? So uh, there's a lot of uh, robotic cases being done in Europe, Asia, and South America, and maybe follow the same kind of hybrid approach that you might have in ASC. So any lesson we could learn from them or any advice you can give them? Because we have a lot of folks now in RSC watching from Europe, Asia, and South America. And as you know, they, are, they have a different kind of uh, business model. They certainly have a different business model. And I think that you would have to look at that. It's no different than the, the business model is different state to state as far as how, the role the insurance companies play, the reimbursements. Uh, I think that any decision it has to be based on two things. Do you think it's better for your patients? If so, you should pursue it. And I think everyone who's involved in this believes that robotics is better for our patients. 
So that drives the first question. The second half is, is there a business model where you can at least break even? Uh, it doesn't make sense to lose money by uh, providing something in an ASC setting that you uh, could do in the hospital and, and not lose money on. And that will depend upon the availability and the cost of the robot and the reimbursement in a given setting. Uh, and I think that varies internationally from country to country, no different than it does to some greater or lesser degree, uh, state to state here in the United States. And how do you uh, factor in the depreciation? And uh, I guess technology ever, always changes and every couple of years you have new models. So how do you factor this in your decision making at your center? Well, I think that a perfect example is my iPhone 7 still works great. Um, so just because it isn't the fanciest, you don't necessarily need it. And the acuity of the cases that we're doing, the ASC, are the lower acuity cases as that uh, slide had depicted. And they don't need stapler, they don't need vessel sealer, I don't need table motion. Um, I'm using an SIE, which is a 12-year-old model, 10 to 12-year-old model, and it's working perfectly fine for me. Um, I think that if I had a forearm SI, um, I wouldn't be having a discussion about getting an X because it would work perfectly well. Um, so I don't think you need the latest and greatest necessarily in ASC. Um, the depreciation comes in two forms. So it's a depreciation being an older model, and then there's the depreciation of the capitalization of the equipment, and that's an accounting issue that you will roll into your business model. Thank you. And move on to Gene. Yeah, hey, Bruce. Hey, Gene. Good to see you, brother. Hope it's sunny there. Um, <laughs> it's Michigan, never is. Yeah, I know. It'll come, right? <laughs> uh, so the question I have is, you have amazing cost data, and I want to know what was it like to acquire that data in being involved with an ASC versus being involved in a hospital? Because I've had trouble at times getting you know, realistic and accurate information from my hospital. Well, certainly being an owner makes it a lot easier. I go to my <laughs> management team and say, I need this. There's that. <laughs> yep. Um, I've heard from every talk about the team, and you're going to hear more about the team from me tomorrow. Um, but when you're part of that team, they're equally invested in wanting this to be successful. And they are looking at those numbers because it is a business and they need to make sure that that business model continues to work. So that data is more readily available. As we all know, in a hospital setting, there's so many other layers. We're able to get that data. It's probably uh, a little more homogenized in the hospital and it's mm -hmm. more difficult to really uh, compare apples to apples. But, you know, our ASC team is certainly very willing to provide whatever numbers. And then we worked, you know, the Optum data was based from my, uh, my physician organization and they have that data. And, and I'm sure that each of you that are involved in a uh, physician organization will have some version of that. All I have to do is reach out to them and explain why you want it. And they were more than happy to give it to me. Gotcha. Question from the panel or from the uh, comment section, is Optum the hospital side cost data owner? Like you work no, for that's Optum our or? physician organization okay. uh, cost center. And, and there's, uh, there's CAVE data, which is unique to Blue Cross. Uh, each insurance company will have their own version, and Optum is one that amalgamates all that data that our physician organization uses. Perfect. The last question I have is, do you get pre-authorization for robotic surgery? No, we get uh, pre-authorization for laparoscopic minimally invasive surgery. Have you had issues with denials from insurance companies with that, you know, that Not practice? One. Okay. No. Me either. Uh, one more question here. What's your take when it comes to the do not do? Like, for example, what's your advice for the folks watching today from your experience? This is the things I, I recommend to not try in surgical center. Like, what's the bad experience you've had or any complication or when you look back at your vast experience, I shouldn't have done that. Well, I don't do uh, ventral hernias because in, with my data, about 20% of those patients will need to be admitted overnight. Since we haven't invoked our 23-hour, uh, even though we're licensed to do so, we just don't staff it. So I choose not to do ventral hernias. I could get a little bit uh, uh, more on the edge and, and try them, but if they need to be admitted, we then need to transfer them back. I've had to open one cholecystectomy, um, and then we just put them in the ambulance and transfer them to the hospital. I have a discussion about that with every gallbladder surgery that I do in the ASC, so they fully understand it. I think like anything, you start with the easier stuff and get wins. You don't want to 
have bad outcomes early on, and then you ramp up just like you should do with when you're starting robotic surgery, even at the hospital. So I haven't had any like, oh my gosh, I wish I'd never taken that on. I've hmm. certainly come across some nasty acute cholecystitis that were coming in for elective cases, and you soldier through them and you get them done. Uh, obviously, I have the advantage of having a little more robotic experience. If I were 100 into my robotic experience, I would probably be more selective than I am at over 2,000. <laughs> Bruce, well, another question. So how about the, the, the folks that actually transition to practice? The young guys, as you know, you have completely different, um, uh, <laughs> different experience. You've been doing this for quite some time. And there's a lot of clinical judgment at first, choosing the right patient. So what's your advice for the younger folks or the folks just graduated into their practice uh, who would like to get to do more of this robotics in the surgical center? You know, um, TJ said it best, uh, get good, get fast, get cheap, um, get good. And you can get good at either place, um, if, especially if it's a new uh, robot to an ASC. People are looking for reasons to cut you off at the knees, especially the hospital people. So you want to carefully choose those patients. So it's, it's not the BMI 40 with the scrotal hernia. Um, you know, start with the easy wins and then move forward. Uh, you know, you can always do those other cases at the hospital. And then once you get better, you're going to figure out where your comfort zone is. And I think that's individual. You know, what I do and what you do in an ASC might be different than someone else. And I can tell you that the things that I choose to do now, uh, like scrotal hernias, like people that have other, multiple other upper abdominal surgeries that I'm doing coles on in the ASC, I probably didn't take those on early on in my experience. Bruce, thank you very much. Great talk, great comments. Let's move on to the next talk. Awesome. Yep. Right, thanks, Our next guys. speaker, uh, thanks, Bruce. That was great. Always, a, always fun to hear you talk.